We're going to be looking this morning at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And it's here that we see Jesus gives these all uh, too familiar words that we ought to take note of. These words that Jesus gives before he ascends back to the heavens. And that is a mission that you and I, as the body of Christ, have. It is our goal. It is our purpose. It is our duty. We are called to make disciples, to teach all nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see that as verse 18 expresses. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Here we have this command that Jesus gives his disciples. He gives it to those who are following after him. And I do not believe that this is a command that is only given to the disciples that were alive during the time. This is a command that goes even on today. I believe Jesus expects this of his people, that we go out into the world and seek to teach Scripture. We seek to teach the truth of Jesus Christ. We seek to teach the gospel that Jesus has come into the world and he has taken upon him the wrath of God for our sins and has been uh, resurrected. He is not under the power of death or hell. And because of that, we have a great hope. And we are called to share this with the world. But before we share it, I want to make note of something that is said here in verse 18. Because the command that Jesus gives us, oftentimes we might go straight to verse 19 and say, well, the command that Jesus is giving starts there. But actually it starts in verse 18 because verse 18 is of the utmost importance when we think about our mission. If we want to go and fulfill this great commission, if we want to go and fulfill the command that God has given each and every one of us to share the gospel, to teach those and make disciples, to lead others to the person of Jesus Christ, we have to take note of what Jesus says in verse 18. Look there, if you will, with me. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's a very short sentence, but there's a lot there. That's a lot to unpack. Jesus says, All power is his. It has been given unto him, and we know it's given unto him by his Father, by our Father as well. Our heavenly Lord. You see, when Jesus came into this world, he took upon him the image of a servant. Paul tells us that elsewhere in places like Philippians, but he shows us that because Christ did that which he did, that which he was commanded to of his Father, because Christ obeyed God the Father, God has now given him a place that is over all things. All power, all authority in heaven and on earth are Jesus Christ. He is the supreme Lord, if you will. He is the one who is over all things. Why is that important to our call to go and make disciples? Because it reminds us that no matter how difficult the situation may seem, when we go into the world and try to teach others who Jesus Christ is, when we go into the world and we encounter, whether it be co-workers or friends or family members who we want to share the message of Christ with, no matter how difficult that situation may appear, we must always remember that Jesus Christ is in control. There is nothing that can be done in this world 
that is outside of his power. Jesus is not ever uh, thwarted. He is not ever confused by something. He's never shocked. Something, n nothing ever occurs in which Jesus is baffled by. Why? Because all power in heaven and on earth are his. Therefore, we must take this knowledge and understand that because of where he is seated, because of his place, we know that he is sovereign. And we have nothing to fear when it comes to sharing the gospel and seeking to make disciples. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 23, listen to what Paul writes here as he speaks about the position that Christ is now in. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 20 which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Paul is saying here that God the Father has given Jesus a place above all principality, all power, all might. That there is nothing in this world that is out of his control or out of his power. That Jesus is in control of all situations. Now, it may not be easy to trust that when we face difficult times in this world, but I can guarantee you the scriptures are quite clear that Christ is in control. And if he is in control, we must then realize that we have no need to fear the call that he's placed on our life. If he has called us to go and to teach and to make disciples and to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to teach others to observe all that he has commanded. We have no reason to fear what man might do to us. Now I tell you, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. If you look at the book of Acts, you're going to see all types of examples of people who seek to share Christ. Who seek to make disciples. Who seek to make Christ known to the world. And there's a lot of pushback there. But even in those pushbacks, even in those difficulties, Christ is reigning supreme. He is still in control. As I was preparing for this sermon, I, I was looking at several commentaries. And one quote that I came across from Matthew Henry, I found to be very comforting in knowing that we have purpose in, or we have great trust in God's purpose. He says, indeed, in all causes and over all persons, supreme moderator and governor is Christ. By him, kings reign. All souls are his, and to him every heart and knee must bow, and every tongue confess him to be the Lord. We have no reason to fear making disciples. I know I can tell you in times past, there have been times when I have felt as though the Lord has been calling me to speak in a certain situation or to go to a certain person and to seek to share Christ with them. And the flesh part of me, that human nature part of me, wants nothing to do with that. There's this voice of doubt that says, you don't have to do that. You know, if God wants them to know who he is, he'll reveal it. Well, yes. But also, he chooses us to be the reason by which they learn who he is. When we are called to make disciples, and I'm going to look at that in just a second here, how I come to this conclusion of make disciples when Jesus says to teach all nations. But when we're called to make disciples, it is not something we can choose whether or not we do. This is a command. This is not an option. Jesus is not saying, if you want to, then you should go and share the gospel. No, he says, go. Every single one of us has a responsibility. 
Now, when it comes to this idea of making disciples, we must understand uh, the very intricacies of the Greek language here that we are reading Matthew from. You see, in verse 19, he uses the phrase, teach all nations. And also in verse 20, he uses teaching them to observe all things. What's interesting here is those two words, teach all nations and teach them, in the Greek, they're actually two very different words. The first statement in verse 19, teach all nations, is this idea of we are not just to talk or give instruction. It goes so much deeper than that. That's covered in verse 20 when he says, teach them to observe all things. That is a, a command to instruct others, to show others what God expects of us. But when he says, teach all nations, there's such a deeper meaning there because it ultimately is, if you translate it in the Greek, it says, make students of people. And is that not exactly what we are in our very life? Think about what the disciples were themselves, the disciples. We have people like Peter, John, James. These were individuals who came to Christ. He called them to himself to follow him. And they gave up all things and spent their time under his leadership, spent their time under his teaching. To be a disciple is to be a student. It's to be someone who yields themselves to a leader, to a teacher, seeks to learn from another. In many ways, it's this idea of a mentor. I, I, of the advice that I've been given in my life, one of the best pieces of advice I have been given is find a mentor in the church. Find someone you know looks to the scriptures and teaches the scriptures correctly. And if possible, see if they would be willing to teach you, to come alongside and give you some instruction. Having a mentor is one of the greatest things that we can do in the church because it reminds us that we all have so much to learn. And when we are mentored, perhaps one day we can be a mentor ourselves. That what we learn from the scriptures, we do not hoard and keep just to ourselves, but we share it elsewhere. And we make disciples. We make students. We call people to learn the scriptures. In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, listen to what Jesus says about being his disciple. John 8, 31 through 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice that he says, If you continue in my word, that is a, an evidence that you are my disciple. If we are to make disciples, we must understand that the, the way in which we lead others to the person of Jesus Christ, the way we lead others towards that which is salvation, the way we direct other people to do that is we use the truth of Scripture. We use the truth that is found in God's Word. We all have opportunities to share Christ and to make disciples, whether we, we want to admit it or not. We all have opportunities. There are people in our lives who we can look at and say, perhaps God has me in this person's life so that I might lead them to the Lord, that I might point them to Christ. Now, we're not doing any of the saving work. That is not up to us. That is all on the Lord. But it is our responsibility to live in such a way as to point others to Jesus Christ. 
And one way that we can do that certainly is by living in Scripture. By not only living it as well, but also teaching it as best as we are able. You see, it's one thing for me to stand here this morning and to try to teach you Scripture. It's another thing for me to then leave this place and throughout the week live that Scripture. And if we are living the Scriptures, if we are abiding in Christ and in His Word, then we point to our own discipleship. But when we do that, when we abide in His Word, when we follow His commands, it gives us credibility to others that we might be able to point them to Christ, that we might be able to show them by example what it means to live for the Lord. And the reason Scripture is so important and why it is such a needed thing when we are seeking to make disciples, when we're seeking to raise up others to know the truth, is because Scripture is one of the greatest things that we have in this life. It is one of the most profitable things. And I encourage you to look with me, if you will, at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I imagine most, if not all of you, at least know this passage of Scripture, that Paul is telling Timothy the importance of the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, Paul is saying here that Scripture has been given to us to be a profitable thing. It is given to us so that we might learn the right way to live. That we might learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Because Scripture reproves us. Meaning it changes us. When we read the Scriptures and we evaluate our lives and compare it to scripture. You know, scripture is oftentimes viewed in the New Testament, especially as being like a mirror. Because when we look at scripture, if we want to truly be pleasing to the Lord, we should desire to look like scripture, to obey scripture. And when we look into the scriptures, sometimes our lives might not match up perfectly. And it should give us reason to seek to change ourselves, not to change scripture, but to change our own selves. Scripture corrects us where we are wrong. It instructs us, it, excuse me, it, it instructs us on how to live a righteous life. And I love verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Meaning scripture leads us to live a complete life. To live a life where we are pleasing to God. Now if we want to make disciples. Then we've got to understand that scripture is going to be a key part of leading others to the person and work of Jesus Christ. I know my own experience. I can tell you that there are times where people in my life or just people in general that I've seen whether it be in our culture today, that want to do nothing more than seek to discredit Scripture, discredit the church, discredit the Christian. But I tell you, we ought to take note. Uh, one of the biggest arguments I've heard in my own personal experience is, well, how can you trust something that's 2,000 years old or 3,000 years old, add all of these ages up. And you have to start to begin to wonder, well, how can I trust it? But you have to realize truth has no expiration date. Truth is truth. If it was true back in the days of Moses, well, it's true today. If it was true in the time of Christ, it is true today. And we must study these things. I'm not asking you to just blindly follow. I want you to study the scriptures for yourselves. 
so that you might be able to then teach the scriptures to those in your life. And this is what we see as being a big part of making disciples, making disciples, going out and teaching the nations about Jesus Christ. It's not always in a formal setting. It's not always a sermon. It's not always a Bible study, but it's a lifestyle. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Paul is talking here on the importance of living by example. If you want to make disciples, if you want to lead people to Jesus Christ, then one of the best ways we can do that outside of sharing scripture and, and living scripture is by being an example of Christ to the world. Verse 1. He says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. That's a lot to take in there. But what I want us to look at mostly in this text is the idea that is found in verses two and three, and going on into the middle. That the aged men, meaning men of a certain age, older, mature men ought to do these things ought to live in this manner verse 3 aged women and I'm not going to say old women I will say mature women refined women uh, ought to live in such a certain way why verses 4 and then going on into 6 that they may teach the young to do likewise we ought to be living for Christ. Ultimately, yes, we should be doing this anyway. But one reason we ought to have in the back of our minds is why we ought to be living for the Lord is that our example can be that uh, shining beacon to someone else. That we might be able to lift others up closer to the Lord by the way we live. That we might be able to teach young men and women how to live a life that is pleasing to God and make disciples by the very actions we partake in. Now, when we get to this point where we are leading people to the Lord, we are teaching them scripture, we are pointing others to the word of God, there may come a time when they believe. It's not guaranteed, but there may come a time when that person their eyes are opened by the Spirit of God. And, and Sister uh, Linda, this morning, that song, just very well fitting, that God would open our eye or open their eyes or open their ears and open their hearts to the truth of who He is. That's when we go into that next command. You see, we go into the world to teach Scripture, we go into the world to preach the gospel, to share Jesus Christ and the hope that is found in Him. And if that time leads to belief, if those individuals that we reach out to, if they come to believe in the Lord, then we are to also make sure that we are seeking to baptize them, not into a certain church, not into a certain denomination, not into a certain preacher, but we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see an example of that I was reading this past week on this in the book of Acts chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch, an individual who Philip stumbles upon. 
And this individual is reading from the book of Isaiah. He is reading the scriptures. But it's very interesting uh, as to what occurs. Because I can tell you, I don't know too many people who I've encountered who I just stumble upon that are reading scriptures that are not Christians or that are not believers. It's a possibility. I'm not saying it's not. But it's a very interesting uh, time that we see because Philip comes across this individual who is reading the scriptures and he ultimately asks Philip to teach him what it means. Give him instruction. In verse 35 of Acts chapter 8, scripture says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. It's here that we see that part of the Great Commission being expressed, that Philip has now preached Jesus Christ. He has shown this Ethiopian man the truth of God's word. He has shown him the gospel. He has declared the hope that is in Jesus Christ. And obviously, this man's eyes were opened. Obviously, this man's heart was changed because he sees a we don't know necessarily if it's a river or a pond or some lake but he sees water and he says what is stopping me from being baptized right here and right now and philip simply says if you believe then nothing is stopping you and we ought to be seeking to do such in the lives of those around us, preaching the gospel so that they too might be associated with Jesus Christ in baptism. There's nothing necessarily magical about baptism. I view it as a symbolic thing that we are being submerged into water and being brought back up. And that symbolizes that we are connecting ourselves to Jesus who died and is now raised again. And we are associating ourselves with Jesus Christ. It ought to be the desire of our hearts today to make disciples and to see people be baptized. To come to know the Lord. I know many uh, churches that I have traveled to throughout the years. You know, we want revival. We want God to move in such a way. Well, I tell you this morning. I believe God wants the same thing, but I don't believe God is going to just snap his fingers and fill the churches and have us just sit here and do nothing. You see, God wants us to be a part of that revival. God wants us to go into the world, go into the nations, go into our communities and to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. He wants us to be exactly as Paul refers to us many times in the New Testament as the body of Christ. You see, Christ is the head of the church. We are the body. The church is the body of Christ. It ought to be moving in such a way to make disciples, to share the gospel. Are we sharing that message of hope with those around us? Or are we tiptoeing through life? trying to avoid those possible conversations. I tell you this, if it wasn't enough encouragement in the beginning, we started this, uh, this morning with Jesus saying, all authority in heaven on earth is mine, therefore go. He leaves us also with another comfort because uh, as we saw in the scriptures, earlier with Thomas, sometimes we are tempted to doubt. Sometimes we are tempted to not trust God as much as we ought. 
Jesus reminds us at the very end of this passage, Matthew 28, at the end of verse 20, by saying once more, not only is he in control, but we are not alone in this command. Jesus says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. John MacArthur, well-known pastor and commentarian, I love how he puts it. He says that Jesus was saying, in effect, now pay special attention what I'm about to, to what I'm about to say because it's the most important of all. It's as if Jesus was saying, I myself, your divine, resurrected, living, eternal Lord, am always with you, even until the very end. We do not have to go share the gospel alone. We do not have to fear that we are alone in this endeavor. Look around you. You have a congregation here. You have believers who... Each and every one of us has the same responsibility. We've all been called to make disciples. We're not alone in this. We have each other. And we can go and join together and share Christ with the world. Maybe it may be the desire of your heart to join with someone here in this congregation and say, what are you doing this week? You know, do you have time off? Maybe we can go and, and talk to a friend of mine. Or maybe we can go have a meal with someone and see about sharing our experience with Christ with them. We are not alone in this. We have the church, but also we have God as well. While Jesus is certainly no longer with us on this physical earth, he is not in a physical body here in this life. You know, I can't point to Jesus anywhere on this earth physically. He has gone to prepare, prepare a place for us, as the Gospel of John says, Jesus promises us he's not going to leave us alone. Jesus didn't leave us to fulfill this command by ourselves. In fact, I love that he tells us in John chapter 14, and this will be the last scripture I share with you this morning. John 14, 16 through 21, Jesus gives us that great peace in knowing that he, though he is going away, Though he is going to prepare a place for us, he will not leave us alone. He is giving us the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while. And the world seeth me no more. But ye see me because I live. Ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my father. And ye in me and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Jesus tells us here that we are not alone in this world. We are not alone in this responsibility to go and to share the gospel. That he has given us the Holy Spirit to be our comfort, to be our guide. And even in that, we see Jesus is still with us as well because he tells us that if we are in the Father, or if we abide in the Father and in him, then Christ abides in us. Brothers and sisters, we have a great command to seek to fulfill. We have a great responsibility to go out into the world and to share the message of Jesus Christ and to go and seek to share the hope with others that we are no longer held by our sin it is no longer our master sin is no longer our lord i'm reminded of paul seeking a, uh, speaking in romans of that saying that while we were at one time slaves to sin 
We are now servants of righteousness. Christ has freed us from death and hell. We ought to make it our joy to go out into the world and to share that message. And I tell you, if we are doubting in that, we have great evidence here in scriptures like this. A reminder that even though it may be, it may cause hesitancy to try and share the gospel with someone. It may cause us uh, a little bit of fear or, or to cause us to be timid. Christ is with us. He is with us always. Not until a certain point and then he leaves us. He says, I am with you until the end. Until the very end. We have no reason to fear. For he is in control. Let us therefore go and make disciples.